You're listening to Paranormal Now on the Inception Radio Network. I'm Alan V. Smith, and join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal pit stops and tantalizing turnoffs. If you're a regular listener to IRN, we have an IRN smartphone app where you can listen live to the live stream from home, on the road, or from that greasy diner somewhere off a dusty road. The app also allows you to chat with other listeners, provides show lineups, and other information and tools. If you're just finding us, please like Paranormal Now on Facebook, at Paranormal Now Radio, or on Instagram, at Paranormal Now. Um, as a brief reminder, this is a podcast, but IRN is streaming 24-7, so you can tune in anytime, and the different ways that you can do that are through Live 365, Stitcher Radio, Nobex Radio, TuneIn, iTunes Radio, Streama, Shoutcast, Winamp, Win Media Player, QuickTime, and IRN um, is also available after broadcast on the Roku channel. And um, if you don't have access to a computer or a smartphone, you can call from your landline or cell phone to listen for free at 401-283-6700. Tonight's guest is Marie D. Jones. She is the author of The Power of Archetypes, How to Use Universal Symbols to Understand your behavior and reprogram your consciousness. I could certainly use some reprogramming on occasion. So I'm certainly welcome, happy that Marie D. Jones is here today. Hopefully she can give us some um, insightful information to help better our lives. And um, of course you can always get her book online at Amazon. And a little bit about Marie. Marie D. Jones is a prolific and best-selling author of nonfiction and fiction, including 15 nonfiction books on cutting-edge science, the paranormal conspiracies, ancient knowledge, and unknown mysteries. Her books include PS Science, PSI Science, How New Discoveries in Quantum Physics and New Science May Explain the Existence of Paranormal Phenomena, Supervolcano, the Catastrophic Event that Changed the Course of Human History, Destiny vs. Choice, the scientific and spiritual evidence behind fate and free will, the grid exploring the hidden infrastructure of reality, and many more. Marie is a regular contributor to New Dawn magazine, Fate, Paranoia magazine, Atlantis Rising, AncientOrigins.net, and Phenomena magazine. She's a screenwriter producer of her own company, Where's Lucy Productions. She has appeared on television and radio all over the world and has hundreds of credits writing for magazines, blogs, reviews, short stories, online articles, gift books, and so on. She has lectured widely on the paranormal, unknown anomalies, cutting-edge science, metaphysics, and human consciousness, which is it, precisely what we talk about on this show. The one thing that I feel like is a little bit left out here in the bio is um, the topic of aliens and extraterrestrials, which I know Marie has has certainly done her fair share of research into as well. Um, so, Marie, I'd welcome to Paranormal Now. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, the pleasure is mine. So, I, I, um, I'm really excited. The, uh, the last episode of Paranormal Now, we discussed um, with Joseph Selby quite a bit about quantum physics and the, the science and the new science that sort of supplements the idea that we are a spiritual beings, um, that we're in a sort of holographic universe and you know we're questioning the reality of life in and of itself and I know these are topics that you've touched on as well so I'd love to hear your take on sort of the nature of the universe but but at the same time I think what you also offer here are some possible solutions to better your life um, so I'll let you take it from there what what was the sole purpose of the power of archetypes well, I've written a lot of books on the paranormal, and I'm using that as in a very general term to encompass, as you said, UFOs, ghosts, uh, but mainly my, my focus has always been how can we possibly use science, uh, especially things like quantum and theoretical physics, these certain of groundbreaking new worlds where there are so many different possibilities how can we use those to possibly help us explain the inexplainable one day so just after writing a lot of books and sort of exhausting the subject matter I you know as with any book uh, it sort of presents itself at the strangest times I was talking with a writer friend about 
what makes The Walking Dead or Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad or Star Wars, you know, what makes these uh, entertaining television movies, novels so popular? And really what, what it kind of came down to was an aha moment of realizing that it's these archetypal characters that are so universal and so relatable. It doesn't matter where you come from, what your religious background is, what part of the world you live in. You get these characters. You relate to them. You love them. You hate them. And then wondering if writers and creators and artists purposely the types or if it was just something that happened in the creative process almost even subconsciously so that's what kind of led to this particular book okay and and uh, in the process of doing that did you find that it in of itself the process um, was healing or helpful to you oh absolutely in fact I think the timing of, of this book couldn't have been better because I was, when I started the book, which is, you know, probably, oh gosh, a year and a half ago, you know, the whole process of writing, editing, and then getting it finally released very recently, was going through some very transformative ex um, One of the reasons why I wanted to write this book is what I've written before it was very emotional. And this is really the first book I've ever written that I felt had a sort of a uh, helpful aspect to the readers, you know, where I was actually offering ideas and tools to make their lives better. And it was really great for me because I went through this entire process as I was writing the book. And I used all these tools and I wanted to really get down on paper uh, why things worked, why certain things don't work. And I'm st it's still a process I'm going through. I don't think you ever just go through it once and everything is perfect. But it was a very timely book on a personal level and I think really on an informative level too because the response to the book has been overwhelming. And what kind of responses do you get from people aside from you know, reviews or, or that sort of thing? I mean, what, what are the personal responses? It's funny because a lot of people didn't realize that one of the reasons why they can never change no matter how hard they try is because they were only trying to change on a very surface level. They didn't think about the fact that they themselves are walking, talking archetypes, that there are symbols embedded deep in their subconscious that, again, they didn't choose, you know, were chosen for them, and that they had this ability to go in and dig deep and literally change not only the way they view themselves but the authentic person that they can then express outward because I think one of the keys here is who are we out in the world you know what kind of masks do we wear and how do we present ourselves out in the world it may not be the way that we desire to I think sometimes mm -hmm. we're totally clueless until somebody tells us you know boy you're off bossy or you know you're always <laughs> irritated what's up with that um, we were you know other people will re reflect back to us who we are and it may not be who we think we are well you know I was, I was just having a <clears throat> an interesting conversation uh, recently and we were talking about race and um, you know my work associate is, is african-american and I'm white and we're talking about all these different um, issues in America and you know we're talking with some other people and the, you know I said look you know even even if we we think we're open-minded um or you know we're progressive in our thinking and things like that that does not mean that we are not subject to subconscious pre-programming you know it's like there there might be some odd behavior or thought process that i'm completely unaware of unless i have a full-on right. conversation with somebody else and they explain certain things to me then it's like oh I didn't even realize I was saying it that way or you know like they're little things to big things exactly. but it's so powerful in the subconscious it's so powerful it is and, and it, you know speaking of race what's interesting is sometimes we resist our authentic identity 
because we feel like it, it might be taken negatively by someone else. And I think we have to get to a point where, you know, it's okay for me to say, I'm a white girl, <laughs> and that's okay, but, you know, you're this and you are that, and but really at the, the core of it all, we're all hum, human beings, um, and not always making who we are a bad thing or a negative thing, and that's, again, that goes to how we identify with ourselves in the world, and it isn't always in a way that brings people together, <laughs> Uh, but other people do reflect to us our best and our worst, and we often only want to see the best, so we kind of deny or just sort of, you know, brush the worst under the rug. But it's a wonderful way to really get in what masks you're wearing and what what you're projecting, so that you can then say, you know what, that's not who I really am. I need to I need to make some shifts here. Yeah. Yep. Um, I was. Um... It's so funny, you know, but you brought that up too. Because I was recently accused of having white guilt, and and I said I was like, no, no, I, I actually don't have white guilt. I have sympathy and I have compassion, um, which you know, you just, to make that a equation um, was was a little scary to me that a lot a lot of people would take that leap. Um, so I think I think there's also just there's so much confusion um, as yeah. to what is an um an amicable mind like um, um what is it you know people think that they're nice people or that they're good people um but then we find ourselves behaving in these like sometimes atrocious ways yeah yeah and i think so, that and those are just darker sides of ourself that we mm -hmm. either haven't dealt with or you know are now being reflected back to us but i also think we need to give each other slack it's okay sure. for you to be white. It's okay for someone else to be Mexican. Mm -hmm. But also going deeper and which is that where we're human. That's more important than the surface stuff. Enjoy and express ourselves authentically into our nationality or our religion or whatever. That's fine. As long mm -hmm. as you're also operating from that deeper level of understanding that we are all one, we're all connected on on a collective level as human beings. And I think that's what people have for, are forgetting. Mm -hmm. They're treating each other like we're not human. And and I guess like you said, the the sort of myth arc stories are are universal and that's what kind of that connects us. Um Marie, hold on one second. Okay, so we just cut out for a quick second so I can call Marie uh, back and get a better connection. Um, so Marie, let's let's pick it up where we um, where I interrupted you. Okay, I'm trying to think where we left. <laughs> well, we I, I'd ask you a bit about universal archetypes and how it connects people together. Uh, yeah, so I I love social networking. And I've spent a lot of time on Facebook and Twitter. And recently it's been hard for me to go on because I've seen people attacking each other from a very surface level of their identity. I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, I'm a Muslim, I'm white, I'm black, I'm Mexican. And not a whole lot of people really understanding that on that more collective, deeper level, we're human beings. <laughs> And I think this is where archetypes come into play because we sometimes get so hung up on certain symbols of how we see ourselves or how we identify ourselves that even when they're harming us or harming other people, we just continue to hold on to them for dear life. And I see this going on so much and I'm, I'm still hopeful that maybe this will help open some people's eyes to the fact that we have a universal nature that we all share and you know until we really sort of excavate down deep enough <clears throat> to find those universal commonalities things are going to get worse we're going to continue to just be attacking each other and everything from hair color to eye color to how long your fingernails are and um where did you get the mm, the um the mindset to even set course upon this road of self-discovery i mean did you have did you have parents that were 
um, forward thinking or spiritual or where, where did that come from? It, not necessarily. I think it came from years and years of my own living through the same patterns over and over again mm-hmm. and trying hard to change my life and succeeding at doing that only to have it go back to sort of a default setting and wondering why, you know, and then talking to other people and finding out that they were experiencing the same thing. Why is it so hard for us to change, even when we desperately want to? Mm -hmm. And then doing research and coming to understand how important the subconscious is and how the vast majority of who we are comes from programming in the subconscious mind that we sometimes aren't even aware of. So that kind of was the road that I was walking down. It's like, I really want to change these patterns in my life. I'm tired of the damage that they're doing to myself and others. But how do I make permanent change? Not just surface, oh, Mm -hmm. it's going to last a few months and then go right back to where it was. Well, you know what? Yeah, it's one of those arguments I hear often. Um, People speak in terms of uh, addiction because this is, you know, at the fore of our conversation right now socially and um and people say you know well why don't they just get their act together or if they really wanted it they could beat it and and i'm thinking you're you're telling someone to use their conscious mind which is is thinking oh my god how how did i get myself in a situation oh my god i gotta get myself out there there are millions of people that say that every day the question is they they they're not fighting their own conscious they're fighting their subconscious and if it's something that you can't see something you can't feel well maybe you feel but you can't you can't grasp it you know slips through your fingers how in goodness name do you do you battle that right and and i come from a background in the addiction and recovery movement and a lot of the reason why i wrote this book was because i had been through 12-step programs and Mm -hmm. i also uh taught a woman's work on addiction, you know, with people who were addicts and alcoholics. And have you ever heard of a Charlotte things, Charlotte Castle at all? The name sounds a little familiar. Oh, uh, she she yeah she um she created something that was called a sixteen step uh, program. It was her oh, her take to modify it more for for women because she felt like um the program of well, i won't say what her other program she was involved with was but 12-step program was sort of missing or misstepping on a few things but you know needless to say not it's not knocking that but she just thought she could you know make something a little bit more applicable to to women or people That's who are not yeah, not I'll have to christian look into that. yeah i actually did uh recently uh it's called bba big book awakening and it is a very intensive uh 12-step program that takes it to a whole nother level and what i loved about it it's similar i think to what you're talking about but what i loved about it is that it did take you down into the root causes Mm -hmm. um over and over and over again and so you know you did not progress in your steps until you got to the rock bottom and and there's a a much greater rate of recovery with bba because it's so intensive and you know, mm. the fourth and fifth steps, all of those steps that are really about excavating, the, getting the junk out and looking at it, uh, you go way deep. And that really was instrumental in my wanting to write this book, because I thought one of the things that always bothered me about 12-step programs is having to get up and say, I'm an alcoholic or I'm a drug addict, because what they're doing is reinforcing that particular symbol or that archetypal symbol, I'm a mm. drunk. I'm an addict. Is there a better way? Can we say I'm a I'm a thriver, I'm a warrior, I'm a recovered, you know, whatever. Because words have incredible power to influence the subconscious. And maybe, you know, when the twelve step book was written, you know, that wasn't that knowledge wasn't as readily available, but now we know how powerful the subconscious is and you have to be careful of every word that you to identify yourself as because all you're doing is reinforcing that for better or worse right and applying what you know all that you just said to the path of an addict in recovery is just as applicable 
to anyone else who is trying to overcome these you know, walls within themselves. Right? Oh, absolutely. We're all addicts. We're all recovering from some addiction, yeah. whether it's to yeah. drama, you know, suffering, martyrdom, victimization, being mediocre, not going for our goals. It's, I mean, we're all sick. Coffee. <laughs> we're all we're all addicted to some pattern of behavior that doesn't serve us. Right. And we're all holding right. on to aspects of our identity that were handed to us and not chosen freely. So really it doesn't matter if you're a drug addict or, you know, a woman or a man who's tired of not meeting the right person and always repeating the same sort of abusive patterns and relationships, mm -hmm. or you're someone who always ends up with the same pay level, no matter how hard you work, no matter how you change your, your career, you know, you're trapped in this particular identity of being someone who only makes this amount of money. We are all embedded in our pattern. Um, right. Now, and some that, people and that's really what, don't care. Yes, and that's why there's such a huge market for self-help books, because, you know, you pick up a, a book, and as much as some of the things in there really make sense, and, and can sort of give you like a spurt of inspiration for a month, a few months. Right, um, right. It sort of, it sort of <laughs> it wears off, right? And then you go buy another one or you reread it. Um, you know, and this is all like some, some form of maintenance, which is, which is good because if you, you know, you're making an effort. Um, but it really is hard to crack that shell and get and dig it down is. deep. You can be addicted to self-help, <laughs> right? Right, I right, mean, right. I think I've been through that in the past where, Oh my God, I tried every program, but every book. And, <laughs> and that's when I began to feel like, you know what, there's more of this than meets the eye. But it's funny because every now and then I would read something that just totally kicked me up to the next level. Mm -hmm. And often it would be a book like uh, The Alchemist, Paulo Coelho's, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, um, or Dr. Wayne Dyer, I've read all his books, but there was one in particular where I must have just been ready, the power of intention. And some of the things that he was saying, it was like, I've read this before, but boom, it got, it got in. It got through the gatekeeper of conscious awareness down into mm -hmm. the subconscious. And I think that that's what we're all searching for when we read books and you know, go to motivational speakers and whatnot, are those few times that, I mean, come on, this is all common sense and we know this, but every now and then somebody finds a way to sort of use the story or symbolism that breaks through the conscious barriers into the subconscious. And even deeper, the collective unconscious of Carl Jung, where, again, we're all living these archetypes that we're not even aware of. And is there an archetype that, you know, you could easily apply to the the addictive mind? Is there something, um, a story or something that, that is applicable specifically to that? Well, I think, I think addict has become a modern archetype. Hmm. You know, we talk about the archetypes that Carl Jung came, you know, wrote about and worked with in his psychoanalysis. But over mm -hmm. time, as we evolve as human beings and we deal with new environmental issues, and I'm not just talking about the environment, but just external issues, social and cultural issues that come up, um, there are new archetypes that we deal with. And I think addict and I think victim is those are the two biggies that we see in our society. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody feels like a victim. Everybody's pointing fingers and blaming other people for their lack and inability to stand up for themselves, to make their lives better, to do the hard work. It, the, being the victim is easier. And I well, think addict is one that we all don't want to own up to and admit that we're all addicted to something that is not good for us, whether it's food uh, you know, shopping, gambling, drugs, alcohol, watching too much TV, being on Facebook too much and not pursuing our grand goals or spending time with family. We're all addicts. Yeah, and um, I think one common addict is the workaholic. 
Um, and like that's me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and because well, in in the sense of, you know, you go to the office or whatever, wherever social situation, and you start um, not gloating exactly, but right. Um, emphatically sharing how hard you work and you slave away and oh. I didn't take this many vacations and and then the other person's like oh wow oh man that's amazing you're you're a great worker blah 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 because they're the, and they're saying that because they want to hear that um because they need to, to feel have some sort of uh you know positive Perfect. affirmation for, me, yeah. for what they're doing yeah and, oh my and... god I'm so guilty of all of that <laughs> See, and I'm admitting it because I'm aware of it now. But at least, you, well, at least you can admit uh, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you yeah. know, in in my career, I, I, uh, you know, I'm very, um, ne- you know, I'm I'm only 38, but I'm old enough now where I, I temper, I temper my time much better, my use of time better than I used to, um, you know, and I've also found that that. You know, getting over that addiction of like, oh, working hard, working hard, it's going to get me there. It's going to get me there. Right. Um, has actually right. freed me to get to wherever I want to faster. It's like, Isn't it's like, that you, ironic. there's like, yeah, there, there's like a, a <laughs> threshold that you cross yeah. and you stop progressing. You're actually regret, you're slowing your, your process down. Yeah. Right. And I think you're prioritizing more because I know for me, workaholism has been, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, kind of you know tracked it to an addiction to achievement and and i one i remember saying to someone i love the deal making the deal i'm addicted to it (laughs) but very recently within the last year and a half realizing that you know i'm getting sicker more often and i'm not as healthy as i used to be and i'm burnt out and i'm always irritable maybe i'm working too much and i'm still working a lot but I just like you, I'm take you take a step back and you detach from that need and you start to realize, wow, I'm really this isn't making me happy. So maybe if I pull back a little and work on the things that are really important, Mm -hmm. I don't have to do all this other stuff to fill the time. And not feeling guilty about taking a Saturday off. I used to not take any days off. Yeah. Now I I take one day a week and I don't do anything and i'm and i'm you know the guilt has been alleviated over time well i'm i'm Um, not going to feel guilty we're going to take a break right now and uh, we'll be right back (laughs) this is alan b smith for paranormal now on the inception radio network i am speaking with marie d jones author of the power of archetypes and we will be right back Welcome back to Paranormal Now. Taking us out of the break was Summertime by DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, a.k.a. Will Smith. I had to play that song because it is burning hot in the New York area right now. This is September and late September, and it is so hot. It feels like summertime. Okay, with the AC blasting and uh, a great conversation with Marie D. Jones, we're going to cruise through the episode speaking of the power of archetypes how to use universal symbols to understand your behavior and reprogram your subconscious so marie um if we could start maybe with one example of uh, maybe a methodology or something that can really um people can really apply well i think the most important thing is that you have to step back from the noise and chaos of life and sit Mm -hmm. down with yourself and get really honest. Probably for most people, the best way to do that is to look at what you're always complaining about. This is my absolute favorite tool uh, in the book. What are you always complaining about? Because that is indicative of you know the misery of the patterns that you're stuck in. If you're always complaining that you're tired, okay, are you doing too much? Or are you not happy at what you're doing are you not eating right blah 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 if you're always complaining that you're broke well you know do you have this sort of lack mentality that you're working from have you been told by people all your life that you'll never be successful and wealthy so what do you complain about and when you actually start to write that down or ask really close trusted friends you know what am i always whining about they'll Mm -hmm. tell you they hear it all the time it's a great way to take a look at 
where you are not being authentic. Because when we're being authentic and expressing who we really are, we feel good. We don't, I mean, I'm not saying we feel great and happy all the time because bad things happen, but we're operating from all different levels of being Mm -hmm. and constantly whining and complaining and feeling miserable means that you're off track. You know, you're off that right proper frequency that you need to be operating on. But it can also be looking at the story of your life. And not necessarily reviewing every single thing that ever happened to you, but the defining moments or the repeating patterns, the most impactful events in your life, do they indicate a repeated issue that you have not yet dealt with? I think patterns really tell us more about who we are than anything else. You can look in the mirror at yourself. You're not Mm going to understand who you are as much as identifying the patterns that operate in your subconscious. Do you and think so, you know, that's... you can meditate and, and mm-hmm. oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, well, do you think that someone can write down those things and uh, without guidance and, and be able to step back and see uh, their patterns or their problems? Or do you think most people could use a helping hand to sort of you know, see what they don't see? I, you know, I think it depends on the person and how honest you can be with yourself. I think, Mm -hmm. I think someone who really, really has reached their breaking point and wants to change would probably be willing to do the work on their own um, and be brutally honest because you get to a certain point in life where it's, well, what do I have to lose? You know, I've already lost everything. And I think sometimes you have to reach that rock bottom or that breaking point in order to do this kind of work because it's not easy. But, excuse me, certainly, you know, getting some assistance from from a hypnotist or guided visual, visualization or meditation, mm-hmm. going to a, a counselor or you know, a therapist or psychotherapist or whatever, a behavioral psychologist who really understands how deeply entrenched our behavioral patterns are and how to get them to the surface and work with them. If that's what you need to do or read a million books, do it. Um, But most, it's sad to say that most people will look at the amount of hard work and the pain that they might be exposed to and say, no, I'm okay the way I am. I'll just keep coasting along the way I am. I think that's tragic. I think, yeah, I think, I think it sort of is. Um, you know, I'm an, I'm an ex smoker. So I, you know, I remember that, that feeling of like, you know, lighting up a cigarette and kind of just like sort of embracing my, um, my, you know, dystopian state at that point in time. And, you know, but that, but that, that sort of meditative state of smoking would sort of like reaffirm it, but in somehow in that reaffirm affirmation, it was like a form of comfort at the same time. So it was this sort of right. odd, odd addictive cycle, and that's what makes it so hard to quit smoking because the psychological is because you can you can get through the withdrawal of a cigarette, you can you can you right. know force yourself to make it three days, seven days. Um, so many people do. It's the mind that gets you back there. Yeah, yeah, because it feels good on some level. It's serving you. It's numbing other mm-hmm. things. It's distracting from other things. And, it, mm-hmm. you know, it, it on some level, it is serving a purpose that it's hard for you to go cold turkey and break away from. Yeah, and it's not unlike um, someone in a relationship where they're addicted to that um, relationship and they can't they can't get out of it. Um, that's that's yeah. what you know the physical addiction of is it's, it feels like a relationship that um, you can't live without right mm-hmm. right and it's one where it, the relationship is both abusive and pleasurable and you're caught between these two extreme right. mm-hmm. wings of emotion you know the sort of um, intermittent uh you know pleasure that's mixed in with oh this is you know maybe giving me cancer so <laughs> but our minds will grab onto the the good stuff and 
tend to deny or ignore the bad stuff. And domestic violence, abusive relationships, that's really what's going on dynamically is that it's very hard to break away from a negative situation when there is occasional positive reinforcement because the mind will automatically react chemically to that positive reinforcement and hold on to it for dear life. And until you get to the point where you've had enough or the fear overwhelms that positive reinforcement. Uh, but even like with weight loss, it's a very difficult thing to do because we become entrenched in patterns that we may not even understand why we put on weight. You know, we think, oh, because I overate and stopped exercising. But there's a reason why you did that. You know, were you suffering mm-hmm. from some kind right. of depression? Did you go through something tragic? Um, a a right, lot right. of cases that I've seen are women who were sexually abused or raped who later put on a lot of weight as a way to not have to be attractive to men and risk being hurt physically mm-hmm. or mentally or emotionally. So when you really start to dig deep and find out what's really going on here, mm-hmm. Then you can then you can start changing. But until you do that, you might lose twenty pounds or you might quit smoking for a year. But boom, you know the trigger happens again, and you're right back where you started. Right. I mean, we can all be very judgmental, even <laughs> even on ourselves, or even be hypocritical. You know, you sort of judge somebody from for some other um, habit problem they have. Um, or yeah. Lack of and you know you have your own. Um, it always reminds exactly. me of the, the um, what's the 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 um, parable by by Jesus um, before you put the I remove the remove the, the plank. moat in right yeah in <laughs> someone else's eye remove it from you remove and the you know plank, what's funny is right, yeah, yeah you do have a lot more compassion and empathy for people when you realize oh my gosh. Okay, now I understand why it's so hard for so and so to stop doing this or that because right, I well, can't stop doing this or that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, as you yeah. know, as I'm I'm getting older, my body is starting to change just a little bit, and <laughs> and it's like, oh, hmm, well, that waistline is a little bit bigger than it used to be, you know. And it, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm think, okay, I, I'm I'm gonna get I'm gonna get to the gym. I'm gonna do it more. I'm gonna be more steady, and yeah, I'm a little bit better than I used to be um but not as much as I want to be right so then I kind of beat myself up like oh, you know, okay next week we're gonna do extra or you know next week we'll right. get there we'll do that um and I'm seeing myself struggle like this right and then you have people who are so harsh on people who are overweight and yeah. I'm thinking oh yeah I if I'm um a skinny person and I'm struggling to get to the gym to, to get off a little bit of weight imagine someone who is right really you know the metabolism is off or what whatever the cause is you know yeah it, yeah we lack it's compassion. it's so yeah you know it's really shameful it is <clears throat> okay i'm gonna but get off know, my soapbox also, but I, <laughs> well but you, you know you bring up a really good point though is we have to be really careful to not identify with our problems and make them an archetype that we're operating from so mm-hmm. if i'm overweight you know if i buy it if i myself as hey fatty you know or plumpy or whatever these funny names that we call other people if mm-hmm. I start buying into that symbol of who I am it's going to be really hard for me to ever lose weight because that's going straight into the subconscious that mm-hmm. is getting embedded as a view that I have of myself and a view that I have of myself out in the world those kinds of things are very difficult to change so we have to be really careful how we treat ourselves and how we talk to ourselves. And, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, I'm a skinny person, but I can say that I'm becoming healthier. You know, I'm a, a healthy person or, or whatever. If I am eating better and I'm going to the gym, I need to stop identifying with what I don't want to be anymore and start to transform the way that I look at myself. Uh huh. So it's like in instead line of leading, what I do want to be. I can, yeah. I think that makes sense. It, and so it's like instead of leading with the negative, you know, as your motivation, you lead with the positive. As yeah. Your, as your yeah. 
because even though the end result is positive that's yeah that's what we often do we think okay i i don't want to be like this anymore i've got it so i'm gonna i'm gonna do this um that makes sense i but I isn't it yeah. yeah but it's funny because see the subconscious hears you say i don't want Mm-hmm. And it, you know, what we've always learned, been taught is that the subconscious doesn't listen to the don't. <laughs> it just hears I want. Mm-hmm. It hears yeah. that need, that sort of desperation that you have, and it holds on to that. And it gives you more of that to be desperate and not want. And that was a huge aha moment for me. Working with affirmations, I remember, you know, years ago, People would say things like, I no longer wish to be poor. I no longer, you know, I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be overweight. And then all of this new research, blah, blah, blah. The subconscious does not recognize the, ne- the negative. It takes everything quite literally, mm-hmm. but in a sort of proactive sense. So if you're saying, I don't want to be poor, your subconscious is hearing, I want to be poor, I, or I want more experiences in my life mm-hmm. that are going to reflect my desire to not be poor. <laughs> and that was huge, 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 huge for me, and I know for a lot of other people. <clears throat> Excuse okay, me, so here, reading, but, you know. And, well, oh, here's, a, here's a trick that I, that I ask you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I... I, I you know, we'll do the meditations or what or, or exercise, whatever it is, um, and it'll feel good, and I'll feel better, and I'll get better. Um, but how do you get to that point? I, I, I don't even know how I get to that point. That we're, I've gotten to that point where I'm more regular in my meditation and my exercise. I couldn't, I can't explain it to you. I can't verbalize how I got there, other than just, you know, trying and trying and trying. Um, so how how does somebody get to the point where they can even try in the first place? You know, well, you um, know, they say, what does it take? Twenty-one days to make a habit, a new yeah. habit. Yeah, I honestly I'm, think I'm, that you gotta fake it until you make it. <laughs> I'm gonna say ninety. <laughs> like, oh like, yeah, probably. It takes a while for me. It. Yeah. yeah, it does for me too. But you know what? I think knowing that it's not gonna happen the first day, or even the first week, or maybe even the first month. Mm-hmm. There again, you have to really be committed to doing this because if you make something a habit, then that sort of, you know, overtakes the current habit that you want to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And in order to make something a habit, you have to repeat that positive behavior until it becomes ingrained in your, it's like, it's like deprogramming somebody who was in a cult so that they can then reprogram back their old authentic identity. And in, in a way, you're reprogramming your subconscious. That is not going to happen overnight. I don't care who you are. You could be the, a yogi sitting up on top of the mountain. I guarantee that they have to do a whole lot of hard work to get to the point where they can change instantaneously. Um, so, yeah, you bring up a really good point. It's hard, and it's going to take a while. But will it be worth it? I think so. I mean, if you have a pattern that is destructive and it's costing you, you know, the life that you really want to be leading, then I Mm -hmm. think even 90 days is worth doing some hard work. Marie, have you ever seen the film? Have you ever seen the film Waking Life? No. uh -uh. Okay, I'll, I'll just send you a link. Um, it is a beautiful film. I think it was 2001 when it came out. Um, Richard Linklater, I was the director. And um, I just, I remember this one scene uh, where th- basically what this film is, it's a, it was filmed as a documentary, essentially, the, mixed with the this story of um, of an actor who is going through this process. I won't give it away. Um, but so it's a mix between a story and actual documentary. It's really interesting, and then it's animated and painted over top. Um, but there's oh. this one. There's this one scene um, where this philosopher poses, you know, um, you know, what's more powerful, you know, fear or laziness or something like that. And then, and then it's like, well, you know, which one came first? Is it, you know, are you just lazy or is fear the cause of laziness? You know, 
from your experience, you know, why is it, you know, sometimes we just go, we come home from work and we're like, forget it. I'm just going to turn the TV on. Is there, is there fear related in that laziness? Or are, you just, sure. or are we just it's being fair lazy? The unknown, right? Well, I think laziness comes from either, you know, just physically feeling awful, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. probably comes from a lot of years of not living the life that motivates and inspires you. I mean, yeah, you can have some bad days, but if you're always coming home feeling that way, turning on the TV as a way to escape, you got to ask yourself, why do I feel so compelled to escape this life? Um, right. So I think yeah. some of that is just the habit that you've gotten into of mm. not facing your problems. And I think that comes from fear of the unknown, because people fear change. Even when change can be so much better than what they have, it's still an unknown. Right. They would rather say, you know, with the, the crap that they are familiar with, than risk possibly, you know, failing or getting worse. And they might get worse in the beginning Mm -hmm. before they get better. So how much easier is it to just keep on with the status quo? And I'm not dead. I'm I'm okay. I've got a roof over my head. I have food. I'm okay. I can just keep doing this. And then, you know, you get the next morning wanting to kill yourself because you hate your job, you hate your relationship, or you don't have a relationship, or... You know, you're in ill health and you know you could be doing things to make yourself healthy, but you just can't find the motivation. Right, right. So I think it is fair, absolutely. Well, you know, what about the person who, you know, hates their job, they're miserable, and they finally change their job and they feel good again. Now, had they stayed in the job, um, not by choice perhaps, that they were miserable in for a longer period of time, um, you know, is it possible to find peace of mind if you were stuck in a situation oh, sure. like that? I mean, because I well, I've, I've is, been through that yeah. too. I've been through that experience where like a change comes and you're like, oh my god, I, all I had to do was change <laughs> this one thing and I feel so much better. Then I think, should I have been cooler and like you know been zen, you know, <laughs> during that period when I was unhappy, you know, you know where. I, I, do you know what I mean? Like, because we're also off, like we're trying to achieve like this great spiritual, you know, uh, central, centered place in ourselves. But then sometimes I kind of feel like not not everyone needs to be, uh, you know, a Gautama or something. So, well, yeah, I remember reading something that said you're not going to ever uh, be happy with what you want until you can learn to be happy with what you have. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, brother, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, but, and, and I kind of thought that was ridiculous. And, but right, here's right. the thing, you know, when you still think that the external is responsible for your happiness, that's how you think. Well, if I have this boyfriend or if I mm-hmm. have this relationship or if I have that job, and then you might be happy just because you made a change and you feel proactive, but before long, you're feeling miserable again. So, yeah, I think that there needs to be something within us that stays the course and can find happiness in any situation or make the best of any situation, but still, you could still desire something better. Um, and, and that is really hard for me to do. I'm really impatient, and I want what I want, and I want it now. And so, But I do remember reading that and first thinking it was the stupidest thing I ever read, until I got it, until I realized if I'm miserable in job A, then I, if I'm just changing the external, I'm going to take with me all of the things that made me miserable in the first place. I'm going to go, I'm going to find new ones. I'm going to find new things in this new job to be miserable about. So if there's some way of just learning how to be you know, at peace and always trying to err on the side of happiness, no matter what job you're in. I mean, there are people that work in slaughterhouses that are happy. And, it, right. and they maybe they separated themselves from what they do. They're not so tied into the identity of what they do for a living. They can see it as, I'm, you know, I go to this job to make a living and to make the money, pay my bills, but that's not who I am. Right. So again, I, it goes back to identity. Have you ever been through an experience where you're in a career that 
the career itself you generally don't like, but just by changing jobs, um, you felt better for a while because you were grateful for the change because this job yeah. for whatever reason was better yeah. than the other. But then eventually it kind of wears off because the gratitude kind of fades away and you realize, yeah. oh, I'm still in a career the that I don't like. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Well, yeah, maybe you moved up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. maybe you've gone from doing something you absolutely hate to something that you don't like but you can tolerate. And I think that as long as you're moving forward or upward, that's good. That's good. You're learning how to yeah. accept change, maybe doing it incrementally instead of huge leaps of change that would terrify you otherwise. Yeah. And at well, some and point, you might get into a job that you absolutely love. I think it was re recently I heard, um, I think it was President, Ob well, you know, retired President Obama um, had said, better is better. <laughs> and I thought, I don't, huh. know, I, don't, I don't know how about that applies to politics exactly, but uh, applying to making incremental changes in your life, better is better. Right. And I think, I think that, yeah. you know, it, Im it implies that as long as you're making an effort, don't discount what you've done. Just because you haven't mastered whatever or perfected, you know, your end goal, you know, be be grateful and be happy that you, you've made a little bit of a step in, in, a, in a positive direction. Um, I like that. Yeah. Better is better because you're, you're better off than you were yesterday. And maybe yeah. tomorrow you'll be a little bit better off. And eventually, you know, I, I always like to, to say to myself, one day I'll be done. <laughs> mm -hmm. with work and struggle and this and that we're never going to be dead until we're dead as long as we're alive there's going to be things to do and things to deal with and issues and problems but also you know enjoyable experiences so we're never going to be done so at the very least can we make each jump or each leap a better one rather than keep going backwards and keep repeating those default patterns that are making us miserable and feel stuck stuck doing the same thing over and over that's a definition of insanity isn't it you know living the same year over and over and over again and calling it a life yeah no that makes sense yeah i mean not accepting reality you know on its own terms uh you know and, and fighting tooth and nail against it i wanted to ask you marie because you have a chapter specifically about the language of symbols um uh -huh. so for for us you know when we're thinking in terms of of um symbols and you know, th you know triggers and reminders what what do we look for in our own life well i think the symbols of our life are again the patterns of behavior the ways that we identify ourselves mm -hmm. the ways that we talk about ourselves and the ways that other people see us and so let's take a very powerful and very prevalent symbol mm -hmm. and that is victim okay everybody whether you're talking politics or religion or relationship or boss employee you know job situation we all know what it means to play the victim. We all know what it means to feel the victim. And if that is a symbol that we buy as part of our personality and who we are, we're never going to get over being victimized until we, we swap that out for something more empowering. Um, martyr, you know, that's another one. Dictator, my gosh, we're seeing this everywhere not just in politics, but people who bully each other on social networking, people who mm -hmm. who troll each other and who fat shame each other. And, you know, my gosh, we've all become a world full of bullies. So I think that that's how you identify. You look at, at, at the way that you see yourself, but also how others see you. You look at also things that make you angry about someone else because they tend to be a reflection of that part of you that you've never owned up to. Mm -hmm. I can be angry at bullies, but have I ever looked at how I bully people? Probably not. So maybe my anger at them is a reflection of my inability 
to own up to how I can be a bully. I think that we all are do that. I think we all do that. We're capable of that. I think there are just certain blockades that we have developed. Um, so, it, you know, it's like we're, we're able to... Okay, let's say like um, you disagree on on um, on politics uh, with a, a close family member severely, and <laughs> but, and most people, when they're in person, they might get a little worked up and you know, oh god, but you know what? They're not going to be like you're a bleep 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 bleep, and so forth. Do you know the, right. the way we speak to each other face to face is often different than what, what actually happens on social media, and exactly. Um, and on the so I one I think it's it's cowardice, um, but it, it's like we edit who we respect more um, than others. So it's like yeah yeah, that's yeah that might be yeah. your that might be your mom or your brother, um, but why is their opinion you know any less valid than someone else's? So if someone else that you don't know with a different opinion you're gonna rip to shreds, but you're willing to listen to them and, and tolerate them, um, right. You know, so we we can very easily compartmentalize. And I think, again, also, though, what we do in those situations is we're making our identity to who we are, our opinions. And they're not. Our opinions uh, are, you know, things that we believe about ourselves and other people in the world based on our experiences, but they may not be associated with our authentic truths that we've probably gotten so separate from we don't even recognize them anymore. And I'll hear people voicing their opinions and I'll think, wow, you know, your your opinion you think is fact, you think is truth, and that's how you're presenting it to me. But it's not. It's well, your you know, we're perception, gonna... your perspective. We're going to take a quick break, Marie, um, and we'll, I'll ask you when we get back. Okay you know, about sacred objects and, you know, what things out there can help break down our psychological uh, barriers. This is Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now on the Inception Radio Network. My guest is Marie D. Jones, the author of The Power of Archetypes, and we will be right back. This is Paranormal Now, and taking us out of the break was Don't Worry, Be Happy by Bobby McFerrin. I'm speaking with Marie D. Jones, author of The Power of Archetypes. And uh, I wanted to ask Marie, you know, what what symbols or physical symbols or objects are actually effective in perhaps our healing process or breaking down psychological uh, walls? Um, so Marie, is there is there anything out there that that is actually effective. I mean, I know we have symbols that we use and we, we say we believe in these things and so forth. Um, but from your experience, can you say that such and such does actually have an effect? Oh, sure. I mean, I think it all influences the mind. Um, it, it can reinforce positive feelings or negative. Um, but some, you know, symbols really are the language of the subconscious. So they speak to us in ways that the consciousness will never understand and will never be able to really express consciously how they influence and affect us. So if there's something that is symbolically powerful to you that represents your desire to change or who you think that you are or a dream or a goal that you have, absolutely use them because you can do all the conscious work of of saying I want to change and here's what I'm going to do and here are my goals and I'm going to lose 10 pounds and I'm going to do this or that but so saying and saying to yourself let's, say, let's use losing weight as an example saying to yourself I'm going to lose 15 pounds well big deal okay because most people just can't do it just by saying it to themselves but what if you were to go by Let's say a woman who goes and buys this beautiful dress that she can look at as a motivator to inspire her to stick to her weight loss plan because she wants to wear that dress to an upcoming event or, you know, to go dancing with friends or whatever. Then that dress becomes a powerful symbol and a motivator 
that goes right to her subconscious rather than the conscious uh, dialogue that you might have of, well, I really should lose 15 pounds because it'll be healthier, my blood pressure will be better, blah, blah, blah. doesn't have the same effect. For people who smoke, I, I remember seeing this commercial with a little boy, you know, who drew a picture of him and his dad. His dad was a smoker and he had emphysema mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. You know, and the little boy gave the picture to the dad and said, I want you to be around so we can do this one day. And, oh, I'm crying. <laughs> and that's symbolic. You know, saying to yourself, I want to do something doesn't have the same impact as coming up with an object or an image that goes straight to the part of the brain that really is responsible for the change that you so desire. Yeah. Well, is there anything that is um, more universal as well? Um, Maybe less subjective, you know, things that like the cross or a Buddha or like you said said in the book, like the Holy Grail. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Are are these things that actually have an effect on us? Absolutely. I think they're universal Mm -hmm. symbols that affect and influence us subconsciously. Even if we don't ascribe to that particular belief system, we know what they are. They're so universal that we know, we get it. We get the cross, we get the the Jewish, you know, the Star of David, we get the um, flags. That's why flags have such simple symbolism on them, because it gets ingrained in your subconscious. The more simple a symbol is, the more memorable it is. We get the, you know, the Fibonacci spiral. We get this, we get that. It, it, it's understood on that deep, collective, unconscious level, where it doesn't matter what part of the world that you're in. Oh, okay, here's a perfect example, a lightsaber. Mm, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care if you're a kid in China or an adult in Iceland you know what that lightsaber is. <laughs> if it's blue, I think it's a Jedi. If it's red, it's the mm-hmm. bad guy. Or whatever. But I mean, that's a, that's a perfect example of a universal symbol that just looking at it, you don't need anything else to go with it. You get it. You understand. And, it, you know, for, for the millions of Christians, that's, obviously it would be the cross. Yeah, uh, well, you know, for myself, th- I have um, a couple little uh, smiling Buddha statues, and right, you know, you know, staring at them doesn't make me a wonderful person, but you know, but it does give me <laughs> it make you know sometimes I see the smiling and I see you know the symbolism of him being full and and um and it, that it's like sometimes I'm like oh yeah okay I need to strive for that a little bit more. You know, it, yeah. it's a it's a nice yeah. friendly reminder, and for me, it's a joyful, more joyful reminder. Um, you know, I was raised Catholic, um, and I know a lot of people are, are Christian, so it, I ask that you don't take offense to this because I mean none. You know, but you know, seeing a man suffering on the cross, um, for all its worth, and I understand that I, I really do. It as a symbol, it doesn't have an uplifting effect on me. Um, and everybody is different, so that that's just me. I I see a symbol, you know, that I have I keep around me that reminds me um, of something positive that I want to strive for. Um, right, and and they can not be this not that Jesus doesn't me- yeah. symbolize that, but that's just not how I feel it. Do you know? No, exactly. And I think you have <clears> to you have to have an affinity with a certain belief for some symbols to work for you. For you know a perfect. Uh, example of how powerful symbols are is in logos and so the apple of you know mass computers you see that it doesn't matter where you are in the world if you're mm-hmm. familiar with computers you're going to know what that means um the the nike uh, is it just do it you know the check mark that's why those logos are so it's so important that these companies get the logo or the symbol just mm-hmm. so just perfectly right so that it's memorable no matter where you are in the world you're going to know what that means you're going to know what the golden arches stand for oh that's mcdonald's i can get a burger Mm -hmm. i think we do that personally with certain things 
um, little, you know, knickknacks or, or symbols or images or whatever. I mean, it can be a painting, it can be um, a candle or anything that kind of cuts through the conscious chatter and affects you subconsciously mm-hmm. and makes you feel empowered. It makes you feel good. I mean, there are negative symbols too. So there are personal symbols, the universal symbols. Sometimes they're the same and sometimes they're not. You know, and why is that when we sit in front of a fire or, you know, have the candle going in the dark? Um, why, why does it have such a, a universal effect on, on humans? It's light. It kind of takes us back to primitive human when fire really, you know, <laughs> kind of saved us. It kept us alive and allowed us to, to thrive. And, uh, you know, the candle in the dark, it's the symbol of light breaking through the darkness and illuminating the shadows. And so we might just think it's pretty. Um, I mean, I, I as a kid, I grew up in New York and it would snow and then people would put their Christmas lights up. And just seeing a reflection of Christmas lights in snow would I would just be ecstatic? Mm-hmm. It was like a religious experience. Oh, it's, an, it's enchanting! It yeah. yeah, the reflection of this light and this magical time, and we thrive on this. We love this, but we don't mm-hmm. feed this part of ourselves enough because we're very distracted by tele, you know, TV and news and social networking and the work we have to do that. We don't often slow down long enough to smell that beautiful rose. I mean, that's such a great, you know, stop to smell the rose. But how symbolic is that? Mm-hmm. You're missing the finer points of life that could actually be making you happy and smile throughout the day because you're so busy, busy, busy. So those symbols remind us to get grounded, and they tell us who we really are sometimes if we pay attention to them. Well, I mean, that certainly explains the attraction to having um, lights, um, and most of us, you know, we we get hooked by the the Christmas lights in the when we're kids. Um, but when we get older, You're it's so like we, pretty we and do magical it. and cool. <laughs> yeah, right, when we get older, it's like, oh my god, I got to put these things up and untangle <laughs> these cords and rah 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 rah. rah. For <laughs> yes, for for a lot, for a lot. But I think a lot of adults <laughs> still like they they like to do it, and some actually get competitive yeah. doing it. And I think that. What maybe what we're missing is the intellectualizing or conceptualizing of why we like it, like you said, because I think we we're attracted to it. Um, we have a like a you know a, a, a visceral experience with yeah. it, yeah. Um, but we don't understand why that is. So I mean, you know, you can have very angry people putting up Christmas lights. Yeah. And exactly. because there's a, there's a part, it appeals to a part of the, themselves that they, but they're not really recognizing that that's, or they're happening. denying, and I think that that is it, yeah. the, our desire for awe, we ha- or for awe and mm-hmm. magic and being awe inspired. Which you could go outside and never look up at the sky full of stars. You know, we're so tunnel vision with distractions and I think people putting up Christmas lights angry are totally missing the point that magical awe that they felt as a kid the first time they saw the house lit up or drove around the neighborhood and we don't have room for awe anymore because now we're grown ups and we have more important things to focus on but we have talk about archetypes we can cut off the child the innocent you know, the, the magical aspects of ourselves that made life so fun and exciting as a kid. Sure, we have to grow up, but there's no reason why we can't see and feel that magic anymore. The world has not changed. You know, we have. Uh, M- Maria? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I lost you there for a moment. Can you can you just go back? Um well, I was just saying, you know, when we grow up, we have a tendency to, to not stop long enough to, to be awed by anything. We're so mm-hmm. focused on the trivials, trivialities of life and how distracted we are 
Um, but the thing is, is that all, those awe-inspiring things are still there. We're the ones that have changed. The world is still, nature is still absolutely amazing and mind-blowing, but we have stopped going outside. We stopped looking at the sky. We stopped looking at the stars going to the beach and just gazing out at the ocean. Some people do, but most of us, it's like, oh, I have more important things to do now. Well, I I grew up near the shore, and that is one thing I definitely miss doing is no matter what kind of day you had, you can just go to the beach at at nighttime or at the end of the day and just just be there by yourself for a little bit and get the sound of the ocean, the breeze, the stars. Um, You know, even if you're not a meditator, that was a great way to just decompress you know, and kind of gather your yeah. thoughts a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think and, I think a lot of people also kind of do... remind you how big the the universe was and how small your problems were. You know, you look at the mighty sky or the ocean and think, oh, all right, well, my little things I'm worried about are really meaningless. Well, I mean that, and that brings one to a place of humility and gratitude, and I think those two things. Um, when you when you feel them um, deeply in your heart, it has quite the profound effect on how you see the world and how you see your exactly. your own yeah. joy within it. And I think what we're seeing a lot of nowadays is that there's a divide between people that are capable of being grateful and people that are so miserable they're just complaining about anything and everything and not seeing all that there is to be grateful for. I see that divide growing. And sometimes, you know, you have to you have to really make effort to step away from the negative side and say, okay, you know what? My life is pretty good. <laughs> I Wow, I do have a lot of stuff to be grateful for. And I think it's becoming harder and harder for a lot of people to break away from the loud, you know, the rest of the world that is sort of screaming and yelling at each other and pointing the finger of blame and mm-hmm. complaining and whining and moaning and sort of jump out of that and just look around and go, you know, wow, I have a whole different perspective now to look at the world from, and it's it's different. And then I think your world starts to reflect that. As I mentioned earlier, you know, I had, you know, changed careers at one point and I was going through that period and, you know, for a time I was, I felt like, oh God, I'm so stuck in this, this crap. And then I went through a period of, N- I, I'm going to get out of this. I mean, I'm just going to get out of this. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. And I just kept thinking that. And I told people, I spoke it out loud. You know, I said it to friends, I said it to family, I said it to coworkers. <laughs> I'm going to get out of this. Uh, you know, and I started looking for jobs and different things. And then literally out of the blue, just this, this opportunity fell into my lap. You know, and it was something completely unrelated. You know, because in my mind, I, I really, I was at a point where I don't care what I do exactly. You know, I have some ideas, yeah. but I just got to get out of this. So I'm just going to keep You're thinking. You're just open to the yeah. change, right? Yeah, and yeah this, you this got to that breaking point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like I hit my, my uh, employment bottom. And, uh, you know, it, this radical change occurred, and it wasn't anything that I had expected. And um, the only thing I could, it's, you know, kind of gives me, you know, goosebumps, because the only thing I can attribute it to is this change of mindset that caused this to happen. Because it was yeah. after I had changed my mindset that this sort of, you know, magic and intervention occurred. Um, so whether that, you know, was a, a law of attraction sort of event, I don't know. But that's that's what it felt like. I've had that happen to me, and I think that is the secret. That is the ultimate teaching of the secret is that the second you change the thought, you start a chain reaction. You know, because the more of the, those thoughts you're thinking, the mm-hmm. more your subconscious is slowly beginning to change, and the more you start seeing the things that you want rather than seeing the things that you don't want. And so, any time I think that we admit to ourselves, "I want to change," that opens the door a little, and then from there, 
you know, just being aware of things that happen around you. And like you said, sometimes they're not going to happen the way that you expect it. That seems to happen a lot. And so it makes me wonder if often we are so stuck on the change that we think we want coming in a particular, it has to be this way. It has to be that job. It has to be that person. That, that even ends up hurting us because we're closing ourselves off to all these other possibilities for something that might even be better. Because we're so stubborn. We think we know what's best for us, but we don't have the bigger perspective. We don't know everything that's out there. So you, you, you surrender a little bit. To, okay, whatever. Bring it on. Let's see what's out there. And it had that opportunity, I think, to sneak in and, and show up. Right. So it's, I guess what I take away from that is to not be so hyper selective, um, you know, the law of attraction or, you know, um, intention, whatever it may be. Um, you know, the universe is extraordinarily complex and there's a lot of people out there with a lot of different desires and wills. Um, so my takeaway is I, I can't just say I want this specific position at this specific job or I need this specific amount of money for this specific thing it's like I'm I'm beating my head against the the wall it's not it's just thinking like that does not allow the flow of the universe to work in your favor of something better because Mm -hmm. what if you said I need uh, that job that job and then you got it and you know somebody at that job ended up stalking you and murdering you I mean that sounds silly but we don't know. You know, I want that person. But that person would be the worst thing for you. Maybe this person over here, you know, is, is the love of your life. We're so limited in what we think things should look like. And so even when when you were using, you know, affirmations or the law of attraction, we're still limiting ourselves by saying, I need, I'm going to make $100,000 as a writer. Well, what if the universe is going to give me a million dollars, you know, in some other wonderful way. Uh, what am I going to say? No. So kind of knowing what you want, but not being so specific that you limit the possibility of it having happening in another way that you hadn't thought of. That was hard for me too. And I still have to correct myself, you know, when I set intentions and goals, which I'm always doing. They don't get so specific, but maybe that's not going to be real good for me. I have to have this particular book deal with this particular publisher. Well, what if they end up being miserable to work with? You know, how about reframing or rephrasing that goal um, to something that kind of opens the door for some even better things to pop up? And like you said, they do. They just sort of come out of nowhere. Uh, Marie, do, can you bring the microphone just a little bit closer? Sure. How's if that? Possible? Yes, that's better. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so, you know, the of of all the the great you know mythological stories out there, um, I, and I think they do actually have a, an effect on how you see the world and how you see yourself. Um, but all of of all of them, the great stories out there, what are what are some of your favorite stories that? Um, I don't know, maybe inspirational is not the best word, but um, to f- help affect change, um, if not in others, but maybe has affected you personally? Well, I, I love the, the Joseph Campbell's motif of the hero's journey, mm-hmm. which I think everybody's heard of, and it's just symbolic of kind of what we go through in life. We start out as the innocent initiate who is then called to action to go on some journey of, you know, that's going to lead to our becoming a hero in our own lives and maybe going through a great transformation. We all go through this. And we go through the the dark abyss and we think that we're failures and then we finally succeed and we go home and we're heroes. Okay, that's the hero's journey basically in a nutshell. So I love stories that take that motif and tell it in different ways. Of course, one of my favorites is um, Star Wars, the original New Hope, the first one that came out, because Luke Skywalker took that hero's journey 
in such a visible, viable way that we all got it. We all totally related to him. You know, starting off with tragedy that, excuse me, served as the impetus for for him to kind of break out of his innocent little shell and go mm-hmm. forward and be a Jedi. And there are a million stories like that. And I think when you watch TV, when you read novels, when you watch uh, a great movie, you'll, you'll find that journey, whether it's a Western or a sci-fi or a romantic comedy. Mm-hmm. And those tend to be the things that we enjoy the most. I mean, it can even be, you know, Cinderella or whatever, a Western or John Winston. Um and I love, and, and I have always understood how important story is to humanity, to the evolution of humanity, to the healing of humanity, to the growth of humanity, without story, because story is symbolic. Story feeds the subconscious, and it satisfies the subconscious, because it's, the story is filled with symbols. When we take that away and we just focus on technology or, you know, things that are really external and that don't really appeal any any bit below our conscious awareness, I think we suffer for it. We suffer for it individually and collectively. So, oh gosh, you know, when I was a kid, I loved Carl Stenberg. He had a book called Rutabaga Stills that was filled with these magical, magical stories so full of symbols and a lot of it was very um, associated with the Midwest, which is where he grew up. But, but it was just, you know, that book has stayed with me all my life. Why? Because of the symbolic imagery of those stories. They still affect me. I couldn't tell you what half of them were about, but I remember the mm-hmm. symbolism. I think the Bible, I am not a Christian, but I've read the Bible a million times and I've written about it. And it is filled with imagery that stays with you, that speaks to the subconscious. So unfortunately, many of the people who follow this tradition take too literally. Um, and that can go for any religious writing or text. They're filled with symbols. Because the people that wrote them, whoever they were, understood that the human subconscious responds more to parable, to allegory, to you know, symbolic storytelling than it does to fact, statistics, numbers, and, and you know, just the facts, man. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I just finished watching Game of Thrones, which I thought I was going to hate, and I ended up absolutely loving it hey, what, because what of the it? archetypal Game of Thrones. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. The TV series, yeah. And, uh, and I, I love television series that have characters that are so archetypal that you will visit with them week after week after week, year after year. You know, whether you're a fan of of The Walking Dead or, excuse me, um, a sitcom, you know, there are a lot of sitcoms that I love because the characters represent something I can relate to on a universal level. Mm -hmm. Right, like being a, you know, Queen of the Dragons. I mean, I can relate to that any day. Or, you know, a mom <laughs> struggling, you know, with right, a teenager. Right. <laughs> or just, Exactly. Yeah, that, that, kind mean, is, that kind of is, though. Yeah. Yeah. Being the Queen of the Dragons, you know, mm-hmm. in Game of Thrones, I'm thinking, well, I can relate to, to Danny and on some levels, trying to make it in a man's world and mm-hmm. <laughs> standing up for herself. And, and really, we latch on to these characters, even the ones that we hate, the villains and the antiheroes and the bad guys. Because we know that there's a part of us that gets that. And, there, the, you know, it speaks to the shadow side of us. And we understand it. And we know that the hero can't really shine unless the villain is really challenging the hero. Right. Well, I think... So it really works on... <laughs> I was just going to say, I think Tyrion Lannister is, is one of the most universal characters on there. Um, now, Absolutely. I, 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 I'm left off in, in season three, so... I'm way behind everybody else. Oh, I'm not going to say anything but, then. <laughs> but but he he seems to be set up as a character that, um, you know, tries to be morally ambiguous, um, but it, but fails at it, and and yeah. you know has a has a good heart in the end. And I think 
I think yeah, the vast absolutely. majority of people can relate to this character. Well, it's funny. When I first started <clears throat> watching, my son said, who's your favorite character? And I said, well, Jon Snow. I mean, he's gorgeous. Come on. But, you know, and then over time I said, oh, my God, I love Tyrion. I love him. I love him. And, and you know, as the show evolves, and I won't spoil it for you, watching these characters develop, a lot of times you feel like, oh, my God, that's my journey. How they deal with their parents and the dynamics they have with siblings and, you know, being being betrayed by friends and romantic mm-hmm. relationships and blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know what? Take out the swords and the, the night walkers and, and set this in modern times and it is still just as relatable. The politics, the religion, the power, the greed, the betrayal, the love, the sex, you name it. It's, it's universally understood. Okay, well, let's hold it right there. We've come up to the third and final break. This is Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now on the Inception Radio Network. My guest is Marie D. Jones, author of The Power of Archetypes. Um, And if you ever want to follow Paranormal Now and get some more information, updates, go to at Paranormal Now on Instagram or at Paranormal Now Radio on Facebook. Hang in there. We'll be right back. Hello, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Remember, you can take your Inception Radio shows on the go. Just download the Inception Radio Network app for your iPhone, iPad, or Android smartphones and access live shows, past shows, guest lineups, and much more. Just visit the iTunes Store or the Google Play Marketplace and download it today for free. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. That was Makaha by the Ka'au Crater Boys from Hawaii because I'm still going strong with the island Hawaiian heat, hot, summer style music because I don't know when it's going to cool down here, but I hope so soon. I'm speaking with Marie D. Jones, author of The Power of Archetypes. And Marie, I wanted to ask you, you know, from a more spiritual, spiritual slash supernatural perspective, um, how do you approach this work? Because much of what we talked about, you know, you, you could apply mm-hmm. to to anyone being an atheist as well, right? Um, but where does the other sort of metaphysical side of this come into play? I think it comes into play where we begin to look at the fact that the mind is, and consciousness is made up of different levels. And the collective unconscious, which is the world where archetypes exist, can almost be looked at as, in the same quantum physics, the zero-point field, or in the Bible, the kingdom of heaven, this sort of rounded, unified, fundamental field that connects everything to everything else and all of us to each other. And Carl Jung was a firm believer in that collective field. So when he, uh, you know, sort of developed the archetype for his, uh, for purpose of psychoanalysis, what he was saying was that there's information in this field that we can all tap into, and we all understand. It may not uh, present itself in, in the way that the conscious mind might readily understand it. And what I love about the paranormal is that there's so many experiences that people have, such as Uh, precognitive dreams or visions of the future or past life recall, remote viewing, you know, any kind of psychic ability. Is it possible that these people are reaching into and tapping into and accessing this very same collective field where there's all this information floating around past, present, and future. And it's, it's operating in a way that is not readily understood by the conscious mind. It's not understood by the consciousness mind, um, but can the consciousness mind be aware of it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we're aware of a lot of unusual things that go on in our lives, in the world, um, experiences that we might call supernatural or metaphysical, beyond physical, you know, the physical or description or the laws of physics, mm-hmm. um, paranormal. 
And I think that all of that ties into the sort of hidden, implicate, invisible field of connectivity that we get, we sort of connect through, through the subconscious, even though consciously we might see an apparition or, or, you know, have some kind of experience that we can tangibly point to. We don't know how to explain it without going further into these deeper levels of the mind, deeper levels of consciousness. How is it that I can remote view a location 500 miles away and tell you what the color shirt the person is wearing without tapping into this collective field? Mm -hmm. How can I uh, have a dream about getting in a car crash at this particular intersection you know, and then three weeks later, boom, it's, and it's the same color car that hit me in the dream. And those kinds of experiences yeah. that we have that we just can't quite explain. Um, I think another good example of that would be uh, near-death experiences or, um, you know, particularly under controlled uh, environments in hospitals where they've done these studies. And someone can make can describe other people in the room or even outside of the room um, right they completely out of unconscious. body mm-hmm. yeah so right but how how do we use that that you know a caustic record or, or whatever whatever that might be some refer to it as the field you know the holographic information right um, you know how do we make use of that to make ourselves better people Well, I think, first of all, we have to realize that we've we've, most of us have lived our lives never addressing all of the programming in our subconscious, let alone how powerful it is. And we don't look at things like the collective, the field, the collective unconscious, whatever name you want to give it, Mm -hmm. because we're way too distracted by what's right in front of us, by what our five senses are experiencing. And I think that it would clear up a lot of the the political and religious problems of the world if we realize that down at the most foundational level of existence, we're all connected. So what happens to me affects you, and what you do to him influences her. I mean, to understand that there's that connectivity, if we all got that Mm-hmm. How different might our behavior be? How would we really be killing each other and going to war? And but you know that the world isn't shaped that way. The world is shaped to keep us distracted, so that greed and power can be the status quo. And that's really sad. But I think if enough individuals begin to open their minds enough to realize that, you know, what you see and what you experience right in front of you, that's nothing compared to the different levels and layers of realities that you're sort of ignoring or denying or just cutting out of your experience because your focus is so laser thin. You have tunnel vision. And so when we start to look at symbolic language of the subconscious and archetypes and why does that uh, you know, beautiful statue affect me so, make me so emotional, when we start mm-hmm. to speak the language of those other levels of the mind. I think it can open up a world of new experiences. And not only that, but it can expand our understanding of who we are as human beings and what we're capable of. Well, you know, it's like understanding the importance of of art. Um, a lot of people don't appreciate right. don't appreciate it and know, well we don't need to study art in school. My kid doesn't need that. Um, because I think what it's so difficult to verbalize that ethereal effect that art can have, you know, and, and translate that into, you know, A plus A equals this. And it's just, um, it's hard, it's hard to, to express that, I think. Well, it is. And consciously, we don't really know. But I think our subconscious gets art and it gets, us, gets it instantaneously. Mm-hmm. Because our subconscious looks at the symbolism in art and goes, oh, I know exactly what that artist was trying to say. I totally get that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, consciously we might be looking at it saying, um, this is really abstract. What the heck is this? 
And I think it's, you know, crop circles. I remember seeing some really elaborate crop circles and mm-hmm. thinking, well, we don't know consciously what, what those mean, but if they're real, I imagine our subconscious would know exactly what they're trying to tell us. Right. Well, I mean, I think it in that movie engages. Arrival, it was that way. I don't oh, know if you I saw love, the movie I Arrival. Loved Arrival. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So look at all the symbolism and how it was. It was, it was evocative. Used to yeah. Kind of right. Create a new a way of communicating, mm-hmm. and and how powerful it was. It, so yeah, I think that there's a part of us that knows way more than the conscious mind would like to admit. We know. Yeah, you know, it's a really a shame. I, I feel like that movie did not get enough attention as it deserved. And I think yeah, it should, should it was, have been nominated you know, as Best Picture. Yeah, you either loved it or you hated it, I think. <laughs> I think you're right, yeah. Because it, it's, and again, it's like Hollywood, man. You know, with, with the marketing. They they market something as a comedy, and it's not a comedy. Just so it can be, you know, like in a category. Or the way they market a film is like a like a epic sci-fi. And Arrival wasn't an epic sci-fi. That's not what it was about, really. Um, right. So I think I think it lost its merits, un you know unrightfully so because it was just mismarketed. Um, anyway, I think I think like a lot of great films, um, Atlas uh, Cloud Atlas is 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 g- gaining momentum and popularity again. When it when it came out, what 2012, um, it was sort of panned by the critics. So then nobody went to see it. Um, but now now I've people are looking at it and it. go, Oh my God, it's a beautiful film. Oh, I love really? it. Really. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's all, it's totally archetypal. It's its all about archetypes, reincarnation, who we are as people, uh, everybody inter, interconnection, love. It's its just, its beautiful. Yeah. That's my opinion. I may be wrong, you know, compared to someone else's opinion, but that's how I feel. Um, yeah. So, so for yourself, how do you feel? Um, do you feel like you're making a, an impact in the world, you know, with the work that you're doing? Oh, gosh, I hope so. I mean, it's really nice when I get an email or, you know, somebody says, oh, my God, I read this book and I loved it. And, oh, it's changed my life. You know, I always kind of have that sort of knee-jerk reaction of, you you read my book? <laughs> <laughs> you did? Somebody read my book? Um, but, I, but I've heard enough people and reviews say that there is some really good meat to this. And I think the reason why is because it was written from a very honest, universal place in me that I was reaching out from. It was not a book that I think I wrote with a lot of conscious awareness of, oh, I want to do this, 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 and achieve that. It was more like, I this is, this is authentic. This is honest. People say, hate it, whatever. Um, but this is what I've been through. This is what I've learned. This is what people have taught me. And this is really coming from a place that I think a whole lot of people can relate to because I, you know, I talk to a lot of people and I meet a lot of people and I always hear the same thing over and over. Why can't I change? Why is this pattern showing up again? And why am I still doing the same things? Why am I still getting the same things in life that I got mm-hmm. before? Because I'm doing some things differently. But then, you know, the more you talk to somebody, you realize, well, they're doing things differently on a very surface level. And it's bringing about a little bit of change. But again, it's like, well, and then going through recovery programs and realizing, why do people go back out? Why do people drink again? Why do people drug again? Mm-hmm. It's because unless you keep Going and digging all that stuff out and meeting these archetypes face to face and replacing the ones that are hurting you with more empowering ones. It's an ongoing process. Do um, you but know, if you never do it, you're you know, you're doomed to repeat your same behaviors. Do you know um when you have uh, broken the shallow thinking when you have broken that surface and that you're now um dipping into the more deeper subconscious mind because i think that there's this confusion there because i think some people think like yeah I'm, I'm on the path of changing and then something happens you know and then off they you know off they are again you know so is there a way to be aware well, of that <laughs> well i hate to say this but a lot of times things will get really really bad 
mm-hmm. because and, and when I was going through PPA, the recovery program, I learned that things will get really, really dirty and bad and hostile and mean and awful before it gets really good because what you're doing is you're going in and you're digging you're digging up uncomfortable stuff. You're bringing it out to the light. And that, that those feelings of misery and discomfort are actually a good sign that you're doing the work and you're doing it right. And so many times we would hear somebody kind of equate it with um, remodeling your kitchen, right? So for weeks, your kitchen is a total disaster. You can't use this. You can't use anything. So you have to go eat out all the time. And there's dirt and dust and debris flying everywhere from all the work going on. That's what you're doing. You know, you're remodeling. And then if you stick with it through the discomfort, you get a brand new shiny kitchen with all kinds of work, wonderfully working appliances. And so for people who like the symbolic imagery, that's a perfect way to describe what it feels like to really change. And I think if you don't feel that discomfort, you're not really changing. You're addressing things on a very surface level. You've got to get down there and get dirty and, and get your hands dirty and feel icky. All right. In order to bring up all this stuff that's been stuck in there, it's almost like this little brand of tar pits. You dig it down into that tar and pulling up all those bones and then looking at them, being honest, and it's hard work. But And, and maybe you do it once, things are great for a while, and then life starts to get to you and trigger you and play upon you again, and you need to do it again. Well, big deal. Isn't that better to make that, you know, continually forward progress than to just say, oh, no, I'm not going to do any of this, and you stay stuck and miserable forever? I mean, that's the choice people have. Mm -hmm. Marie, can you bring just make sure the microphone's a little bit closer if it isn't? Okay. Yeah, okay. How's that? That's much better. Yes. It started to sound like you're getting (laughs) a little distant. Um, Okay. Yeah, so... uh, where was oh yeah so chakras chakras I wanted to ask you about before we run out of time um, how how do you work with chakras and actually do you need to can can you just not use that as a practice at all and still accomplish all the things that you're saying or or do you think that's that's an, an essential essential process to understand who you are as a being in order to to raise yourself up to break your habits and, and so forth I don't think it's necessary, but I think for people who, who you know, have that belief or they work with their chakras and they understand what they mean, that symbolism works for them. Other people might use a different, you know, process, guided visualization or meditation. I was really surprised as I was talking to Shelley Wilson, who supplied in the book a wonderful chakra meditation excuse me I hadn't even thought of chakras in that way and so when she was telling me how they are archetypal that kind of triggered me to thinking about other things that were such as astrological symbols and Native American totem animals and I think whatever works for you you could use candles and if if those candles symbolize something powerful to you and lighting them in a certain order and doing some kind of ritual, whatever works for you, do it. Um, So I think it's wonderful for people who look at that and say, oh, I love the idea of working with the different energy centers of the body and making sure they're harmonized and balanced. But that, if that's not your cup of tea, it's, it might be something else that's going to work even better for you rather than forcing something that you're not quite relating to on a deep level. Okay, so if you had a choice of one <laughs> one technique, right, and said, look, if there's only one thing you could do and that I could offer you, um, what would it be to 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 make a change 
my absolute hands down favorite and only because I recognize in myself, but also because I see so much of it in the world today. Every time I turn on the news or go on Facebook is what are you complaining about all the time? By asking, what do I keep complaining about? You can get such a great picture of the repetitive patterns of behavior that keep coming up that you're obviously unhappy with or you wouldn't be complaining about them. So that's a great, and even asking your friends, what am I always moaning and groaning about? Just, you know, I'm just curious. And they will tell you, they will reflect back to you the truth that they're a good friend. And so if you're constantly complaining about money, you need to deal with those archetypes that have to do with poverty and, and, and wealth and, and being worthy and deserving. You're constantly complaining about your diet, you know, whatever it is can really help you pinpoint what you need to work on, what's not working. Look for the symbolic representations of what that is and deal with that because that gets down into the deepest level of the collective unconscious where you need to do the work. Otherwise, you're going to keep repeating the same patterns over and over again. If you're feeling de- Depressed or angry, is Facebook the best place to go? Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be, but not anymore. Oh, isn't that wow. funny? I'm... Isn't that funny? Oh, yeah. it's awful. And I, I'm, yeah. gu- I'm guilty as anyone else because when when I f- was you know first on, on Facebook in its early days, um, it was a much more playful and fun place to be. And it still is, but now it's mixed with so much oh, anger oh gosh. and debate uh, and trolling. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. And I you know, I go on to see what's up with my friends and my groups that I have, my screenwriting mm-hmm. and writing stuff and then I find myself getting anxious when I see the fighting and the debating and I realize this is good for me and it's not productive and Right. And I used to stay on for hours anyway because I was addicted. And I broke that because I realized that it was making me miserable. And now mm-hmm. I have to be honest and I have to look at what is making me miserable and change it and stop it. Yeah, I think I'm about to start my withdrawal process of that as well because, you know, sometimes I, I yeah. think, all right, I, I can make a difference, right? I can, if I comment on this one thing, if I try to make this one point, just a little tiny bit of this and that here and there over the years. Maybe I can actually make a difference on Facebook. And now I'm beginning to think, maybe not. Maybe No, because but, it's but, a haven for people that are buying into their archetypes and not letting go, mm-hmm. no matter how miserable they are. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so finding anybody to change on, on social networking is becoming mm-hmm. very difficult. Well, you know, I mean, we're all angry about something here and there, but there's some people that post angry post um, yeah. af- after another. And I'm tempted to, to you know, unfriend them, um, not because I don't like them, I just don't like their posts. And because, well, because after a while, energy, it's too much, you know? You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I started doing that. I love you, but I have to protect my energy because mm-hmm. I want to do some wonderful things in this world. And I can't if I'm anxious and miserable and depressed (laughs) right so can social media be healing in any way oh absolutely i I think people make great friendships you can exchange information you can find groups of people that love the same things you do Um, but i think you just have to be really careful to stay away from opinion and other people complaining and trying to bring you down but you know just try to to stay away from that if you can unfollow people or unfollow them. They'll never know. You can yeah, unfollow can... people without unfriending them. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and on that on that topic, where where can people follow you um, online? I am on Facebook at Marie D. Jones Writer. I'm on Twitter at Marie D. Jones. I'm on Instagram at Marie D. Jones. And I lately have been having the most fun on Instagram because all you do is post pictures. It, it, yeah, it lends itself <laughs> to being a little bit more negativity. playful. Yeah, exactly. It is. It's more fun. It helps, helps me, you know, de-stress when I've been writing all day. And also, um, mariedjones.com is the website, right? Your your homepage? Yes, mariedjones.com. 
cool thanks for coming on murray do you have um any other works coming up uh down the pipeline or i actually have a book that just came out called demons the devil and fallen angels and Damn. it is a comprehensive yes. look at those very uh interesting subjects and i'm currently writing a book called the emergency survival guide uh, because I'm trained in survival response and disaster response. And that'll be out next year. Okay, so we can affirm that you're a workaholic. I, I've tempered it a little bit, but I okay. still love to work. I really do. <laughs> if you if you go to Marie's w website and you see the, l the list of books up there, it's astounding the amount of work that you've done. <laughs> so, all right, cool. So if you if you have any uh, last minute thoughts you'd like to leave us with on this on this topic? You know, just don't be afraid of change, especially if you're miserable. I mean, you have one life. Do you really want to live it being unhappy and complaining all the time? And if you do, that's your prerogative. Yeah, or, and you can pick up the ukulele and make that a, a hobby. I'm telling you, it really, there you go. really helps. <laughs> <laughs> it, right, it sounds cool. fun. Actually, my son has one, but I haven't played it. <laughs> yeah, it's a joy for sure. All right, Marie, thank you so much for coming on to Paranormal Now. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll hook up again in the future. Sounds great. Thank you for having me on the show. Okay, thank you. All right, this is Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now on the Inception Radio Network. I want to thank Joe Champion, uh, MJ Lucas, and uh, Bob Tarmac, the producers on IRN, for making this program possible. And to all of you for listening, I thank you. And until next time, live in the mystery. Be well.